Hi, today we have um, Iveta Semuradova, and she will be talking about diverging eigenvalues, and you can read the rest of the title. So when you're ready, just go ahead, Iveta. Okay, thank you for introduction. So I will talk about diverging eigenvalues in domain truncation of Schrodinger operators with complex potential. And this is a joint work with Peter Siegel. He's also in the audience. And hopefully soon, uh, the results of this work uh, should appear on archive. Uh, so what you will see here is uh, unpublished yet, but hopefully soon you will be able to uh, read the preprint. So the structure of my talk will be as follows. Uh, first, I will start with some motivation, explaining to you what the domain truncation is, what are the features, and what phenomena uh, occur there if we do uh, domain truncation for uh, shredding operators with uh, complex potential. I will show you several examples. Also, um, some other examples with a strong coupling regime, and there will be lots of pictures. Then we will move to uh, the more abstract and mathematical part um, of the talk. So I'll, I will try to keep it as simple as possible, but maybe it will be a bit uh, abstract. Uh, I will formulate assumptions, which we need in order to formulate a theorem, which will prove our results. And the third part will be, uh, again, uh, about examples, and we will apply this abstract theorem to specific scenarios and specific examples. And you can look forward to uh, some more uh, graphs and uh, videos. <laughs> so let's start with the motivation. Uh, first, um, for those who don't know, I would like to remind you what a domain truncation technique is. For the sake of simplicity, I will uh, present it here in these uh, first slides in one dimension but uh, it's possible to do it in, in general in d dimensions in a more general setting so we have a schrodinger operator uh, with a potential and this potential uh, q uh, can be complex in general and we will um, suppose that it's somehow nicely behave that this uh, operator has discrete spectra and we would like to find a spectrum of this operator um, often we are not able to find the spectrum analytically, and so we would like to compute spectrum of such operator numerically. That means that we would like to take this operator on some truncated domain and compute the spectra there. So the truncation of the domain means that the action of the operator is the same, but I truncate the domain, in this case, the real line or L2 uh, R to finite in interval minus Sn, Sn. And I create a sequence of operators Tn, which uh, live on different Hilbert spaces, L2 minus Sn, Sn. And I can impose um, different boundary conditions on these endpoints, Dirichlet, Neumann, Robin, it uh, don't really uh, matter. In this talk, I will, for the sake of simplicity, talk uh, mainly about Dirichlet boundary conditions. Um, and when we take the limit as n goes to infinity, uh, as n will also go to infinity. So we have the sequence of these intervals, which uh, start small, but they are getting bigger and bigger. And in the limit, they exhaust the whole real line. And we would like to ask if um, this approximation is good in some way. If we can, um, you know, forget that the operator is on the whole real line and uh, for example, compute the spectra on the finite interval. So the question we are asking is if this approximation is spectrally exact or if the discrete spectra of these operators converge. So this means two things. One thing is that all the eigenvalues of the limit operator, so the operator which is on L2R, all of those eigenvalues need to be approximated by those of the truncated operators Tn. OK, so if I have eigenvalue in the spectra of the limit operator, then there needs to exist a sequence of eigenvalues, lambda n, which lie in this spectra of the these truncated operators Tn. And the sequence converge to lambda. So all the eigenvalues of the limit operator are approximated. That's one part. And the second part is that this approximation cannot produce any 
extra limit points, any spurious limits that are not true eigenvalues of t. So if I have a sequence of eigenvalues, um, so these eigenvalues which lies in the spectra in these truncated operators, and this sequence has some accumulation point, then this accumulation point needs to lie in the spectra of the limit operator. So uh, these are the two um, things that describe spectral exactness. And um, in this article by Begley, Siegel, and Hetero in 2017, they uh, proved that domain truncation technique is spectrally exact for a vast class of operators. So here are the conditions in one dimension, but uh, you can go through this article, it's very thorough. And they have these results in D dimensions for uh, all kinds of subsets and boundary conditions. So it's more uh, difficult there, but just so you get the idea uh, for vast class of potentials, uh, domain truncation is spectrally exact. So these conditions, there is some smoothness of the potential. Uh, the first derivative is controlled um, by the potential itself. Uh, the real part is non-negative and the potential uh, grows to infinity uh, at infinity in some good sense. So as I said, they stated this theorem in very general setting in RD and they have this subset omega n of uh, the whole space RD and these subsets exhaust the whole space RD in some good sense. So it's a very good result. And what does it mean? It means that uh, if I have some eigenvalues in the spectra of the limit operator T, then in the spectra of the approximating operators, these truncated operators Tn, there are some eigenvalues lambda kn, and they asymptotically behave like lambda k plus some perturbation. And this perturbation, this remainder, it goes to zero with when the n tends to infinity. And we actually know that it tends to zero exponentially fast. So it means that if you want to compute a spectra, of uh, operator which is defined on the whole real line, but if your operator or whole space and your operator satisfy the conditions uh, from this article, then uh, you can just you know compute the spectra on some finite interval or on some finite set, and you will get um, eigenvalues which are very very close to the actual eigenvalues. So you can use uh, these numbers. So that's very nice and very useful in application that we can compute numerically a spectra of uh, uh, operators which are on some unbounded domains. But there's a catch. So uh, yes, it's nice, it's spectrally exact, but uh, the spectra of these uh, truncated operators stay n, it may also contain other eigenvalues. And those, for all of this to hold, they need to escape to infinity in the limit. But if you just compute the spectra of this truncated operator Tn on the finite interval, then there may be some other extra eigenvalues, which actually have nothing to do with you know, these you are interested in. So let me show you this on an example. So I suppose you are all familiar with uh, imaginary cubic oscillator on real line, and we can also uh, truncate this problem to these finite intervals minus S and S and and define the truncated operators on these respective Hilbert spaces. Here on the graphs, I have the real and imaginary part of the spectra. On the x axis, there is the length of the interval. So this is the Sn. And we can see the sequences of the eigenvalues, how the spectra of these truncated operators Tn, how they look like when I am uh, enlarging the interval. Okay, so here is S and it's one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so I am getting the uh, interval bigger and bigger. And I am looking at what is happening with the eigenvalues as I change the interval. And I can see two things. So first, there is this spectral exactness. And we can see that there are sequences of eigenvalues, like for example, this very first one or the fourth one, that just like do a little curve and then it's a horizontal line. And this horizontal line, these sequences, which looks horizontal here, they are the ones which approximate the eigenvalues of the limit operator. So if you want to know the eigenvalues of imaginary cubic oscillator, and for example, you are happy with the first five, uh, it's okay <laughs> with some precision 
to compute the eigenvalues of this operator on this bounded interval minus 66, and you will have very good um, result. But what you can see, it's not the only thing that is there. There are also these other uh, sequences which escape to infinity. So this is a pretty common phenomena that we have uh, two sequences which are real. They met, they meet at one point, and they, uh, so this is the phase transition, they uh, create complex conjugate pair and they escape to complex infinity. So these are the diverging eigenvalues I will be speaking uh, here about and which I will be interested in here. Uh, so just a bit of uh, history to mention that uh, this uh, uh, problem was introduced in this article by Bender and Betcher, where they introduced a family of uh, operators and they indicated that for n greater or equal to two, uh, these have uh, real spectra. And the domain truncation proved in this article, which showed that it's spectrally exact, also apply on this. Um... So Iveta, may I ask something? Yes. So uh, it seems that when you uh, truncate into a finite segment, uh, PT symmetry is always broken because you have these pairs. Uh, and is, is it broken by the boundary condition, you think? So um, similar patterns will happen if I will have different boundary conditions. So this is for Dirichlet boundary conditions, these yeah. graphs. But for Neumann boundary conditions, it will, you know, it, these curves will be a bit different, but the pattern will, will be actually more or less the same. So we will actually see that this happens for very huge class of uh, Schrodinger oh, yeah. operators with complex spec spectra, if the, uh, sorry, complex potential, if there is some imaginary part, which is significant, but then the this pattern will uh, yeah. occur. But for the cubic, the, uh, those, those diverging, uh, they will always diverge. The, the, the broken, uh, the complex uh, conjugate pairs will always diverge and escape to infinity in the, in the limit of infinite uh, line. Yes. So uh, breaking of supersymmetry, disappear, uh, sorry, breaking of PT symmetry disappears uh, in the, in, in the non-compact case. Non-compact? I mean, in the infinite, in the infinite. Yeah, in the infinite. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so these all they occur only on the uh, in the spectra of the truncated operators, mm -hmm. and then in the limit, they you know escape to complex infinity and they are not there anymore. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, and uh, so to mention that uh, interest in these diverging eigenvalues uh, was also shown in this article by Ginter and Stefani, I think. Wegenter is also here in the audience, uh, where they describe the diverging eigenvalues for uh, imaginary polynomials from uh, this class of uh, operators. And they used very different techniques than we are using here. So they used analytic WKB and Stokes graph analysis. So if you are interested in this, you can check uh, their article for the results. Uh, as I said, the domain truncation can be used in arbitrary dim dimension. So here is an example introduced by Brown and Marletta, uh, where we are truncated, truncate, truncating uh, mm, radial, radially symmetric uh, potential on exterior domain in two dimensions. So we have uh, the, the operator looks like this. There is a Dirichlet Laplacian and complex uh, harmonic oscillator and the domain is the whole plane minus the closed unit ball uh, about origin. And so we can also do the truncation in suitable way. So in these settings, it means that the truncated domains are uh, balls with radius uh, Sn minus this uh, unit ball. So they are annually, which are mm, enlarging and in the limit, they exhaust uh, this, this domain. And so here we can see some numerics, what's happening in this scenario. So there, there are the real and imaginary part of the spectra of these truncated operators. Again, on the x-axis, we have uh, this uh, Sn, so the radius of the ball. 
And we can see the same feature, the horizontal lines, they uh, approximate the spectra of this operator T. But we can also see here, maybe not very clearly, the pattern of diverging eigenvalues. And I ask, uh, in the case of a ball, doesn't this, how sensitive is it to the shape of the ball? I mean, the ball can have corners and, and uh, edges and so on. Um, do you get a different pattern for each different shape of a, of a ball? You, this is not an effect that would occur in one dimension, but, but when you're in higher dimension, you would see something like that, right? It must be sensitive to, uh, you know, what, you know, what if you take a, um, you know, a parallel of pipe and, and, and expand to infinity at a different rate in the x direction compared with the y direction. Yeah, so if you are interested in the occurrence of these diverging eigenvalues, it's uh, definitely, uh, we uh, studied some examples, for example, of the sets with corners, you know, like sectors and such, yeah. and definitely the corners uh, uh, have, uh, have impact on this uh, diverging eigenvalues. So, so, would, so this so, has to do. This has to do um, with something that's been studied uh, in, in great detail, which has to do with corner layers and boundary layers, um, having to do with the physical structure of the domain in which you're working. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean th these are these can be very thin, but there can be very rapidly changing eigenfunctions inside of the corner layer. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, de definitely the corners. Um, I will have later example with X squares, which have corners. So it doesn't appear everywhere. <laughs> uh, here, it's not um, about the shape of the ball, but about the fact that uh, you have some edge, you know, that this uh, ball inside is not there. So you have some like edge there. May I comment to uh, this? Yes, <laughs> so I'm not sure if I, I, would I very often time. played around with potentials which had uh, delta functions inside. So I had to realize that if you make a, a delta function times a coupling, if you uh, make the coupling stronger, it gets like an intransparent wall. So if you put a particle somehow in a box which is enclosed by two delta functions, you can make the limit of increasing the uh, couplings uh, to very strong values. And then you get intransparent boxes uh, and you get bound state in, in these boxes. If you reduce the couplings, then these eigenvalues, they disappear in the complex plane towards infinity by making the uh, boundary uh, transparent. So when you have now your limits as n and minus as n, and there would be a delta function which somehow is uh, transparent or not so transparent, you could produce by increasing the coupling somehow extra bound states in your problem, which are not present. And when you switch off your delta functions, somehow they disappear to the continuum. And they always appear pairwise because of time reversal invariance. Okay, <laughs> thank you for the comment. Yeah, I will also have an uh, example on the delta function with uh, in strong coupling regime there uh, in a bit. So I will move on to it. Um, yes, so here uh, we are in the two dimensional case. And um, in order to see this more clearly, I have here also video. If we, because this is radially symmetric problem, we can decompose this to infinite number of one dimensional problem where this L is angular momentum. And here I have a video which shows uh, the typical pattern. So this is in a complex plane and uh, the different colors are for angular momentums so equal to one, two, three, four, five. And you can see that some of the eigenvalues, so the video progress as I enlarge the SN. And you can see that some of the eigenvalues, some of the sequences approximate the uh, eigenvalues of the um, limit operator when I take the limit. So those are these on this line, but there are also these diverging ones. 
So for example, this one. And what you can observe here that actually the trajectory is not dependent on the angular momentum that for all the L's uh, asymptotically, the path is the same. So this is the typical behavior we will see um, everywhere in these examples. Um, we can see it not only in domain truncation, but also uh, when we have uh, strong coupling. Um, so I have harmonic oscillator and imaginary perturbation, and there is some strong coupling G in front of this uh, perturbation. There is just some function f of x. I am in one dimension. So this class of operators actually have some uh, motivation in physics, in fluid mechanics. Um, the spectra of these operators are connected to stability of solutions of uh, two-dimensional Navier-Stokes equation. You can read more about it in those articles. Uh, so specifically, the behavior of the infimum of the real part is interesting. And it was studied in these articles by Gallagher, Galinier, and Schenker, uh, where they put as this uh, function fx um, this function, 1 over 1 plus uh, absolute value of x to kappa, where kappa is positive. And here, um, you can see again the numerics, the real and the imaginary part. And actually, all the eigenvalues, when g tends to infinity, all of them goes to infinity, but some of them go slowly. And some of them, you know, goes uh, to complex infinity more fast. So you can see it here as well. So these are also interesting problems. And there is this case with uh, double delta potential, um, which was, which we can find in this article by Baker and uh, Mityagin. So again, it's in a very similar form like this one. And now the function f of x is double delta potential. And another more complicated case maybe is this uh, family of operators introduced in article by Calicetti and Graffi, where there is not only harmonic oscillator, but um, there can be any even polynomials. And there is a complex perturbation, uh, which is controlled by this uh, complex G. And so here, for example, for the case m equal to 2, and G being uh, Im imaginary, we can see this typical pattern. So we have two real sequences. They connect uh, in one point, and they go to infinity in complex conjugate pairs. So we can see lots of similarities. And the question I'm asking here is, if there is any way how we can describe these diverging eigenvalues, how they behave, if we can maybe obtain some formulas to describe their uh, asymptotic behavior. And the answer is yes, as you will see in my talk. And here I will uh, explain you on a simple example, the strategy on how to, how to obtain these formulas. So I have imaginary cubic oscillator and I will truncate it to a finite interval minus an n with directly boundary conditions. And the trick is, which is uh, taken from this uh, article by Boscia, Helfer, Andri, and Robiano, is that we can do a translation to one of the endpoints of the interval. So here I'm showing it for the left endpoint minus n, but we can also uh, do it to the other endpoint. And so this is a unitary uh, operator, and I don't change the spectra if I perform this uh, translation. So I have new operator with the same spectra, and it's on. 0 to n. And another step is that I will employ another unitary operation, uh, scaling. So I will scale with this n to alpha. OK. So the spectra is still the same, but I have uh, another a bit more complicated operator, which has prefactor. Then there is a second derivative plus some imaginary polynomial with this um, powers of n, and there is absolute term. And can, you here, explain, can you explain what you mean by unitary in this case? Because when you say unitary, that's a statement about the, the, the states and the, and, the, and the metric and so on. I mean, now you're talking about a Hilbert space. Yes. So I mean, this is not just a discussion of eigenvalues. Now you're using the word unitary. So that has to do with operators. 
Yes, so these operators, you know, these R and N, I'm telling that these are unitary operators. So uh, basically it means that if you take the norm of the uh, NF and the norm of F, they have the same norm, you know, it's... But what norm are, are you using? Yes, yeah, so here everywhere, I'm just in L2. So here I am in L2 minus NN. Uh, so are you talking there, about... I, I didn't define any metrics here. And you're talking about spectral equivalence, equivalence. So this means uh, you need invertible transformations, which need not to be unitary to preserve your spectrum, no? Yes. <laughs> yes. So I, I didn't introduce any metrics or anything. I am like in standard Hilbert spaces with standard inner product. And in these standard uh, spaces, it's unitary. So here I'm in L2 minus nn, here I'm in L2, 0, 2n. And the uh, product is just integral from 0 to 2n, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there are no metrics here. I actually will not discuss any metrics in this talk. Uh, can I just make a small point? If you apply a translation like e to the i p times n, You'll shift the operators, but you don't shift the domain. You still have it; still acts on the entire real line. Yes, but now I am uh, translating the truncated operator. Yeah, but you. Oh, and truncated is on on finite interval. Oh, you're starting off with a finite interval. Yeah. yeah. So, so the problem is, you know, like it's on the whole real line, but I'm looking at the truncated operators. Because the diverging eigenvalues, they were in the spectra of these truncated operators. So, yeah, but the, but the trun truncated domain doesn't change under a translation. The translation affects the operators. It doesn't affect the, the, the core, the, the parameters. Mm, what? <laughs> So, so you don't agree with this, or with what you don't agree? I think the domain is the one you had before. Well, why should it be affected by a quantum operator? <laughs> yeah, I don't really have a blackboard to write it down here. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But like here, x lied between minus n to n, and if you shift x no, no, you x minus n, you've x lies the... between 0 and 2 n. No, you've shifted the operator x. I think she, she plays with two spaces. One is the uh, Hilbert space uh, on, the, on the segment from minus n to n, and she also uh, tacitly uh, considers the entire real life, uh, entire real line. So she ex you extend the, the function from, uh, the, from the Hilbert space between, from minus n to n to the L2 you think about the function uh, at, at the same time as belonging to the, to the two spaces. So then you, you, you just shift it. So maybe in these computations, you just like forgot, forget about this first line <laughs> and start from here. This is my, this is where I start. Okay, this TN, this truncated, which is on minus NN and the eigenfunction, the functions, you know, they have yeah, these so, directional boundary conditions. So if you take a function uh, in, in the Hilbert space of the finite segment, yeah? Yes. Uh, which, vanishes, which vanishes at the endpoints, yes. you can easily extend it to a, a function on the entire line, which vanishes at those points. And then yeah. uh, on that function, you consider shifting. So you can get out of the of the segment for minus n to n. That's what Philip is what. Uh, oh about. yeah, yes, yes, yeah. You you can do that. Yes. I don't understand what the problem is. I mean, you have two different Hilbert spaces, and one operated from the first space to the second space, and that is unitary, which means it preserves the inner products and norms. That's all. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm actually also not really sure what the problem is, but uh, 
Yes, so, so is everything exactly clear? Exactly the problem. It's a, it's a big mission, mixture in the PT community that one has actually two definitions of unitarity. One is what Ali just re repeated. It's the operator the theoretic definition of unitarity that you have different, may have different Hilbert spaces and you are just mapping from one Hilbert space to another Hilbert space. And once the spectra and the norms are, the inner products are for different vectors are preserved, they are called unitary. Whereas in uh, physics, in, uh, when you have uh, group theoretic considerations, you are usually using one Hilbert space and then you are considering just unitary transformations within one Hilbert space. These are different uh, formal definitions. They are slightly different, but in, at this point is very essential, yeah. Yes, so, so here- They're not really the, different. My, my, my operators map from, so it's written here, it, for example, for this R, that it maps from one Hilbert space to another Hilbert space. And the same thing comes uh, for this one. I just didn't write it here. So, but here you can see, so this N, it maps from L2 minus NN to L2 zero to N. Yep. And then this R maps from L2 zero to N to L2 zero to N one plus alpha. So it's a unitary operator between two Hilbert spaces. Yes. <laughs> Is it okay like this? Can I continue? Or, yeah? Sure. Okay. So no one is saying anything, so I will continue. So we did the translation and then we did the scaling. And now I have a freedom of uh, choice of this alpha. Okay, I didn't specify this alpha. So I will choose this alpha in such a way that I will make this linear term dominant. So this operator, I can write it now uh, in a compact form. So this means alpha will be minus two thirds, right? So it will be this prefactor, then an operator and some absolute term in this scaled interval. And this S and this operator is second derivative, the linear term. And there are two terms which have negative power of N in front of them. So now I can conjecture that if I take the limit with N uh, going to infinity, then these you know, will disappear. So I can suggest that S N will converge uh, to every operator on a half line, okay? And this every operator on a half line is a very well-known operator. Um, it has purely discrete spectra. We can compute the spectra precisely, and it's very nice. And so if this convergence is in some way good, we will talk about this later. <laughs> if it's in some way good and, you know, the isolated eigenvalues converge, then it would mean that if Nikkei is in the spectra of this S, then Nikkei plus some perturbation plus some remainder will be in spectra of Sn. And if this is true, then from all these transformations, uh, we get a formula for eigenvalues which lie in the spectra of this Tn, those Tn, the truncated operators, which we had on the previous slide. Okay, because this, okay, sorry, there should be N, N, and R, okay, these letters are wrong, sorry. But uh, we had uh, the unitary operators, so they don't change the spectra. And then this was the prefactor and absolute term. So these are the eigenvalues of Sn minus this absolute term multiplied by this prefactor. And these eigenvalues should asymptotically lie in the spectra of the truncated operators Tn. So this is one set of sequences because I shifted to one of the endpoints. And if I would do the translation to the other endpoint, I would get another set of sequence. So the complex conjugate pairs. Um, this all is, uh, this is a formal uh, computation, spe specifically this part. So in order for this formula to be true, to say that this is correct, I need to uh, prove that Sn converges to S 
in a good sense that the isolated eigenvalues of S and converge to S. So this may remind you a bit the domain truncation we discussed at the beginning, but it's a bit different because now, okay, the S and they lie in different Hilbert spaces, but also there is perturbation of the potential. So I have sequence of potentials and sequence you know, of operators lying in different Hilbert spaces. And I would like to know if they converge. So this is the topic of uh, the main theorem I will state now. Um, under what condition this convergence in general for uh, many other cases holds. So I will start with some assumptions. Uh, so I have, may I yes. ask a question, uh, a small question? Are your, uh, this, con this formula on the, on the previous slide, are they exact or are they asymptotic? Asymptotic. Asymptotic, so you have uh, first of terms actually. Sorry, that I have. So it means you have a full series here. So it, it, it means you have uh, only the first terms uh, that you are considering. Well, so this RK, RKN, it's a remainder, and this remainder tends to zero as n tends to infinity. Yeah, OK. OK. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So I have sequence of domains. Um, which are subsets on, of RD, and they are open and non-empty. And I have some limit domain, omega infinity, which is unbounded. So it can be the whole space or, for example, some cone or something. And these omega n's, these approximating sets, are subsets of the limit set. And they exhaust omega infinity in some suitable way. So we had it with the intervals, like we have small intervals and, and the limit. They cover the whole real line. Uh, it can be similar thing with balls and with uh, all kinds of other sets. Then I have sequence of potentials, Qn. So they need to satisfy some regularity conditions. Then they need to have non-negative real part. And they need to uniformly satisfy this condition. So this condition, um, there is some estimate on the norm of the gradient of the potential by means of the norm of the potential to three halves. So this is some information about the growth of the potential, and it's weighted with some uh, constants. This m delta is just some positive or non-negative number. And this epsilon delta, it needs to lie uh, between 0 and epsilon critical. And this epsilon critical, it's known to be equal to 2 for the self-adjoint case. You can look it up in this article by Everett and Geertz. But for non-self-adjoint case, it is not known precisely yet. So what we mm, computed is that it lies somewhere between uh, these numbers, 2 minus square root of 2, which is something like 0 0.58 and 2. So it lies somewhere there, but uh, there is uh, right now there is not some better result. So it needs to satisfy this assumption also in order to uh, define properly the operators. So we have domains, we have sequence of domains, sequence of potentials, so we can define sequence of operators. And these operators can be introduced properly by quadratic forms, also because of this estimate. And also what we have is sequence of cutoffs, cutoffs xi n. So it may be look, looking a bit difficult, so I'll try to simplify it. So we have the big set, the limit set omega infinity, and the approximating set, the small one, omega n. And the xi n cutoff maps from the big set to 0, 1 in such a way that it is 0 everywhere outside the small set. And inside the small set, it is, uh, its value is somewhere between 0 and 1 in such a way that the transition from 0 to 1 is smooth enough. OK, so there cannot be some jump. So this, like uh, the gradient and the Laplace, they need to be controlled. They need to be finite, so no jumping. Smoothly enough transition from 0 to 1. And there is some condition on the, um, on the domains. So this is just, uh, this is uh, very straightforward that if I apply the cutoff uh, on a function from the domain of the approximating, operator Tn, then it needs to lie in the form domain 
of the limit operator t infinity and vice versa. If I take a function from the domain of t infinity, I apply the cutoff, it needs to lie in the domain of tn. And the fourth and final assumption is that the potentials qn need to converge in some good sense. And so the convergence of these potentials uh, is um, described with this quantity tau n. And so this tau n, there are three terms. What do they mean? This first term is telling me what is happening inside the small set. OK, so there is the cutoff. Uh, and so it's telling me how big is the difference between the approximating potential and the limit potential, how much they differ inside a small set. Then the second and third term, they are telling me about the growth of these potentials Q and Q infinity outside the small set. So on the like edges, you could say, or infinities of the big set. Because this zeta n, it's like one minus the cut of support, sub support of the supplement. So this is telling me about the behavior of the potentials outside this, this, uh, the small set. And this needs to, all of this needs to go to uh, zero. And it actually will tell us something about how fast, um, how fast um, it all converges. So maybe this was a bit abstract. So here is an example of um, some problem which satisfy these conditions. So for example, we have a sequence of potentials Qn, where there is imaginary harmonic oscillator and some remainder. And this remainder goes to zero in infinity norm. And the domains can be, for example, enlarging triangles. Um, so I'm in uh, a plane here in R2. So I have small triangles, slightly bigger, and it's getting bigger. And in the limit, it exhausts the sector. And when we had these cutoffs, these xi n, so for example, xi 3 would be defined in such a way that it will be 0 everywhere here. And one choice of the cutoff could be that it will be 1 in the orange triangle, and then it will smoothly go from 1 to 0 from the orange line to the green line. So it's looking a bit abstract, but actually a huge class of potentials and sets um, satisfy these conditions. And the theorem, statement of the theorem is saying that the operators Tn converge to T infinity in generalized norm resolvent sense. So that means that uh, for big enough n, when I have a number in the resolvent of the limit operator, it will be also in the resolvent of the approximating operator. And if I take the norm of the difference of this resolvents and the generalized means that there I have this pro projection here because they live on different Hilbert spaces, then this will converge. And I can also estimate the rate of the convergence with this quantity tau n I had on previous slide. So the the resolvents converge, and therefore there is no spectral pollution. It actually goes uh, from this statement. And also the spectral co projection converge in norm as well. And we also can estimate the rate of the convergence. We have also spectral inclusion. So together we have this spectral exactness I talked about at the beginning. So spectral inclusion for isolated eigenvalues. Uh, it holds also for eigenvalues with um, some bigger multiplicity, but here, for the sake of simplicity, it's only for simple eigenvalues written down. So uh, Nikkei is in the spectra of the limit operator, and there are these approximating eigenvalues Nikkei n in the neighborhood of Nikkei. And so this converge, and I can also estimate the rate of the convergence. And also, not only the eigenvalues, but also the eigenvectors converge in norm as well. And I can also estimate um, the rate. And so here, you can see how fast, actually, it converges. That it's dependent on this uh, kappa n. And this kappa n is similar to this tau n I had before. So the first term is the same. It's uh, the behavior inside a small set. Uh, the difference of the approximating potential and the limit potential, how much different they are. And the second term uh, speaks about the decay of the eigenfunctions. 
So you can see that the rate of convergence depends a lot on how much is the um, operator perturbed. Because in domain truncation, I, thought, I told you that it goes exponentially fast, but here it can go much slower because of this. So this is an abstract theorem which we can apply to all kinds of different scenarios. One scenario we can apply it to is the domain truncation. So I told you before that uh, domain truncation was uh, studied thoroughly in this article. They proved spectral exactness of domain truncation in RD, exterior domain for wide class of complex potentials for wide class of approximating domains with different you know, shapes and boundaries and boundary conditions and mixed boundary conditions. And if we apply our theorem to domain truncation, we get some new results. So we also have these perturbed potentials and not just the sequences, uh, sorry, not just the domains. So the potentials can be also perturbed. There are sequences of potentials. We also have broader class of unbounded uh, limit domains. So the, the limit domain cannot be, uh, don't have to be only uh, the whole space, but for example, a cone. Uh, also the approximating domains can be unbounded as well. So we can apply it also to operators with non-compact resolvent. Uh, for example, if we have Schrodinger operator with uh, exponential, that's an operator which exhibits essential spectra, but if we take the, um, if we take the approximating domains to be minus infinity and then we can also apply it and we have some specific uh, rates of convergence for the resolvents. So now uh, we will apply uh, this abstract theorem to specific uh, scenarios and examples I showed you in the beginning of my presentation. So let's get back to imaginary cubic oscillator. Uh, you already saw how I derived this uh, formula And this theorem proves that this formula is, is good, that these eigenvalues do lie asymptotically in the spectra of the truncated operators. And here you can see the same uh, graphs we had at the beginning, but now there are these blue lines. So these blue lines are these eigenvalues, and you can see that they describe the diverging eigenvalues quite uh, nicely. Mm. So this looks nice. Here I actually computed uh, also the first correction of this uh, remainder. Uh, so it looks a bit better. But in general, as I said before, the convergence can be a bit slow. So the pictures don't have to be this nice. And so here I will show you a video um, where uh, red dots are those knee case. And oh, sorry. And the blue dots are you know, like these ones, the approximations of Nikkei's. And so here you will see how slowly actually it converges. So we are looking for the blue dots, which are trying to approximate the red dots. And we can see that it takes a while. Um, may I just ask a quick question about the yes. previous graph, the, the previous slide? Yes. If you can put it on, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, if I let Sn go to infinity in the graph on the right, the imaginary eigenvalues don't disappear. They just, they just become infinite. Uh, yes. Yes, so it is. Yes, so the it, diverging it eigenvalues, they, they diverge to complex infinity. Yeah, so you, st you still have broken PT even in the continuum limit. Well, with, with the way you've approached things, and yet we know that should not be the case. Well, complex well, infinity does not lie in the spectra. Well, that's uh, not not the way it's stated. <laughs> okay, it's not stated that p squared plus i x cubed on the real line has some complex infinity solutions. It, it's usually stated that all the eigenvalues are real. Okay. Now, Philip, uh, <clears throat> you may think about it uh, in, in a certain similarity to uh, Carter-Penrose diagram, uh, diagrams. 
Yes. You have in, in the finite region, everything is fine. And at infinity, you have a certain structure. It's like black holes or other cosmological singularities. So have, and it's very similar here in, in this case, only in, in, in spectral theory. It's, it's the, the corresponding theory seems not yet existing. Here. Okay. By, by the way, the other question I'm going to ask is, do you know why that happens when SN goes to infinity? Do they have to go to infinity? No, no, you've, you've done this calculation and that's a feature of your result. Why does it happen? So why do they go to infinity? No, no, if you no. let SN go to infinity. Yes. Why do the complex eigenvalues become infinite? Yes, yes, so I understood the question correctly. Yeah. Uh -huh. So actually, because of the spectral exactness of domain truncation, they have no other choice. <laughs> okay. You that's, that's, yes, that's true for any for any uh, operator. So you see these horizontal lines here, right? These horizontal lines they approximate the eigenvalues of i x cubed on the real line. And from the statement from this article, Begley Siegel Tetter, the result mathematical that it's spectrally exact. We know that all the sequences. Here, if they have an accumulation point, the accumulation point needs to lie in the spectra of limit operator. Yeah. So if, if there would be you know, some like other uh, sequences and they would do like something, I don't know, like this and, and they will have some accumulation point, this accumulation po point would need to be in the spectra. But, but you know, these horizontal lines, they described all of, all of the spectra of this one. So if there are some other eigenvalues in the truncated operators, they need to escape. They cannot be in the spectra of the limit operator. By the can way, I, Philip. Can Philip. I make a, a remark, just a, a brief remark about that? I mean, you can see a very, very big difference between what's going on in the finite domain and in the infinite domain. If you think of the problem as just a conventional WKB problem, okay, uh, on the infinite domain, you have a, a multi-region problem, okay? It's a two turning point problem and you need to do asymptotic matching in order to find the eigenvalues. But in the finite domain, there isn't any asymptotic matching. You simply write down a WKB solution and demand that the WKB solution satisfy boundary conditions on the finite interval and the eigen spectrum just comes from that integral condition, that's it. Okay, however, on an infinite interval, you, you don't have a single formula like that. You have to match together various uh, WKB solutions. So the whole nature of the problem changes when you go from the finite interval to the infinite interval. Okay, it's a, it's a very, very big, very discrete difference about what's going on on an infinite domain compared with a finite domain. Uh, Carl, may I comment also on this point? Actually, what I saw is when you're doing this WKB, <clears throat> the point that you're mentioning is absolutely correct, but even on the finite interval, you have, when you're looking at the WKB expansions, you have uh, these two square root uh, different signs in the square root term in, in, the, in the exponent. And there you have a very subtle uh, interplay of the Riemann sheets. And this is exactly what, when you have on, on the full line, what you are seeing as monodromy, it's surviving also on the finite interval. You are mm. seeing this, you have, a, you have a different sheets which are matching. And, and what seems not present in Iveta's and Petter's picture is that uh, these are two questions that I wanted actually to ask at, at, the, at the very end, maybe I can uh, ask them immediately now. When you have this approximation that you're using from one endpoint and from the other endpoint, you have these two types of mapping. And I'm suspecting, and uh, th th there are very strong indications from WKB that these uh, uh, approximations are absolutely breaking down when you're reaching the region of this exceptional point because you're entering the picture from different sheets there. And the I exception see. points is mapping these different sheets. So this monotremy uh, feature, which is present on, on the full line, what uh, 
Patrick de Ray, uh, um, Dateo and, and, and Dunning were considering in, in, in their paper, you have the monodromy at infinity. And this monodromy is mapping also on the finite region. You have different sheets and at the exceptional points, you have a very subtle uh, picture of different branches which can connect and others are prohibited to connect. There's a super selection rule, uh, a, a very deep one, but there's still to be worked out in, in, in every detail. Uva, can I, I can wanted I to just, comment. Uh, uh, can I just comment on what Uva said? Um, that's a very, very good point that Uva is making. Um, and what is interesting is that um, this effect of monodromy and so on, um, this also persists in the case of, of the classical theory. Um, what is going on in the complex yes, plane exactly is yes, very, yes. very, very subtle. And yeah, yeah, um, sure, 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 sure. It's exactly. Okay. This is all this, this huge underlying geometry, which seems not yet still worked out in, in full for all this PTs. That's right. Very, but very, I, I wanted very to very comment good. on what Philip said. There's a very simple point. If you put somewhere uh, on the real axis a delta potential, then uh, many solutions of the Schrodinger equations are blind for this delta potential if there's a certain anti-symmetry of your wave functions. Only the functions which really see the delta potential, uh, they are affected by this delta potential. So when you have somehow boundary conditions which go not to infinity, but which end somewhere at finite range, you break some symmetry of your theory. And this produces solutions which are sensitive of this symmetry breaking. When you put your boundary conditions to the infinity, you somehow restore your symmetry of your theory. And then these uh, uh, broken symmetry solutions have to disappear from the spectrum. And okay, I think this okay, is a very yeah, simple yeah. point. Can we, can we let Iveta finish? She has still quite a lot of transparencies and we should have this, this discussion at the end. Please, Iveta, can you please continue? You. Yeah. yeah, yeah. so just a quick comment that all of this is taken from like uh, convergence of the spectra and operator convergence for point of view and that uh, even though these eigenvalues are here in the spectra of Tn, they go to complex infinity and so they are not in the spectra of T. So even though this pattern is here on the, in the truncated operators, it actually doesn't you know, say anything about uh, the spectra of the limit operator. They disappear. Okay, and uh, okay, so the convergence can be slow. I will try to go maybe a bit faster because it's already one hour with all these <laughs> discussions. So yeah, take your time, you had a lot of questions. <laughs> so we can uh, also apply it to other scenarios. For example, imaginary exponential, which I mentioned before is uh, operator which exhibit essential spectra as well. Uh, but we can see these diverging eigenvalues here. Also, you can see that maybe here it doesn't look so precise because the convergence is slow. So here we have only one, uh, one set of eigenvalues and not two. Um, then uh, this uh, radially symmetric potential on annually we saw at the beginning. So here is a simplified version where it's just uh, I to absolute value of X squared. Uh, on this um, exterior domain. So as I said before, we can truncate it and decompose it to one dimensional problems. And we can apply again the abstract theorem and we will get uh, these eigenvalues. So not always you have these complex conjugate pairs here. And on the previous example, you just have one uh, set of these diverging eigenvalues. And here on the pictures, uh, we have the spectra of these operators uh, T and L for different angular momentum. And we can see that the uh, diverging eigenvalues, they, uh, they are not dependent on the L. So this main term does not depend on the L and they uh, go to complex infinity uh, on the same path. Um, so, there are um, more statements which you will find in our article. So for example, for this one dimensional case, uh, we formulated the specific uh, assumptions uh, in the form of explicit conditions on the potential. So it's easy to check it. 
In higher dimensions, it's more complicated and you need to go back to the abstract theorem. So, but you can do it. It's also possible, for example, to take uh, two dimensional rotated squares. So they have these uh, uh, corners <laughs> as we discussed as well. And so um, there is some imaginary polynomial and we have these rotated squares which exhaust a whole uh, plane. And again, we can uh, do the transformations, apply the theorem and obtain specific asymptotic formula for diverging eigenvalues. And so this Nikkei in the one dimensional case, they were um, eigenvalues of the area operator on the half line in higher dimensions, uh, it's area operator in a sector or in a cone more generally. So this we all know. Uh, also, we have results in these other scenarios. Uh, so for example, this family of uh, operators I introduced at the beginning, uh, which has this uh, physical motivation. So for example, in this article by Schenker, they have this result, a uh, lower estimate on the real part of the spectrum, that the real part behaves like absolute value of G to 2 over 2 plus kappa. And what we, uh, if we apply our theorem to this scenario, we uh, find out that this result was actually optimal and that these eigenvalues are in the spectra of these operators dg. So we have this g to 2 over 2 plus kappa and we know the constant, which is eigenvalues of this uh, class of operators, which also can be computed. So here, again, you can see the blue curves are uh, these eigenvalues and they describe the behavior of these diverging eigenvalues. Uh, Baker Mittagin have uh, this potential with double delta. Uh, this operator with double delta <laughs> potential in the imaginary perturbation. And in their article, they prove that the number of non-real eigenvalues diverges as g tends to infinity. And so we have smooth version of the potential um, where these peaks of the delta are uh, approximated, well, the behavior is uh, approximated with these exponentials. So as the g is bigger, these peaks or so are bigger. And so in these scenarios, uh, when we had domain truncation, we were shifting to these endpoints. But in these scenarios, we are uh, shifting and making these transformations uh, to stationary points. So again, we have specific assumptions uh, for this class of operators. I didn't write them here because even like this, it's a bit long. Um, and so we can shift to those um, different stationary points and apply the theorem and get the formulas of the eigenvalues. So if we apply the theorem at the stationary point zero, then we have um, one set of eigenvalues and then we can also shift to the other stationary points x1 and x2 and we get set of uh, two sets of complex conjugate eigenvalues so you can see that the, these ones they are the blue ones and they do this typical pattern but also uh, this one describes these real ones. Okay, so maybe it's a bit chaotic, but here you can see um, those pairs of eigenvalues which um, meet and make the complex conjugate pairs, but also there are these who are just real and uh, go to infinity like a uh, real sequence because these Nikkei's are eigenvalues of imaginary cubic oscillator which has real spectra. <clears throat> Okay, and uh, last example, a bit more complicated. So Kalichet and Graffi studied PT symmetric phase transition for uh, this class of operators, and they have some nice results in their article. And so if we look at this operator and maybe rescale it a bit, so we can see it a bit better. Uh, for the case m equal to two, we can see that this potential has uh, four stationary points. So one is at zero, one is at i, and then there are these two, which are like this. And again, we can try to apply the theorem 
in these different stationary points. And actually what we find out that here at zero, and also if we do the translation and all these uh, trans transformations to um, this point x1, then there is no good limit operator. So we don't actually obtain any uh, formulas for eigenvalues. But if we do the complex shift to here and there, to x2 and x3, we get um, formulas for the diverging eigenvalues. And here is the numerics for it. So again, the typical pattern and our formulas describe in a nice way uh, the behavior of these diverging eigenvalues. For the case when m is greater or equal to 4, it's a bit more complicated. So the stationary point at 0, it yields sequences of eigenvalues in this case. So um, for every m, we have uh, these sequences. But if we want to find some other uh, sets of eigenvalues, other sequences, then there is a question to which points to which stationary points we will do these translations. So as I said before, this minus i and i, they don't produce any good limit operator. So we don't really obtain anything there. But we can do the translations here and basically to any other point. And the higher is the m, the more roots we have. So the more options we have. And what is interesting is actually that we find out that um, if we should shift to these points, then we obtain good formulas which uh, which describe the things that are happening in the numerical computations. But for example, if we shift here or here or here, then we do obtain some formulas, but they are not in the numerics. And actually for these scenarios, our theorem is not broad enough because then if we shifted uh, the real part of the potential is not non-negative. So there needs to be some generalization and some explanation why so, these points work and so Iveta, other points don't work. So Iveta, can it be that, for example, for the fourth order, uh, for the fourth uh, um, power case, uh, uh, as, as this, from this famous picture from Carl's papers uh, uh, of the stocks wedges, uh, then there are two stock wedges beneath the real, uh, real axis, and there is a curve, a, a quantization curve, which goes from the from the uh, uh, third quant quadrant to the fourth quadrant, along which you can quantize and get those real eigenvalues. And it seems that when you take uh, your two uh, uh, extremal points, uh, uh, like those two just beneath the real axis on a symmetric way, uh, that you might uh, arrange such a contour. And uh, that's the PT symmetric contour. And maybe that's the reason why your method works in that case and not in the other case. It's possible, yes. Like what, what I found so far that if I shifted here, then the imaginary part has um, global extreme. And if I shifted here, it doesn't have global extreme. Mm. So maybe it has also something to do with this, but. I will comment on this part in the end. Uh, yeah, I would like to comment also. I mean, the whole point here is that, I mean, just as Joshua said, the whole point is that if you are in a finite domain, the notion of a Stokes wedge is simply not there because you're imposing strict boundary conditions, okay? But as you go, as you allow the domain to become infinite, Stokes wedges emerge. So the the emergence of Stokes wedges that, that you, you observe here is very complicated. And as Uva pointed out, there are um, antecedents of this that, that happen even before the domain becomes infinite, but they're, they're very subtle and they're buried in the complex domain. Okay, so I mean, this is a very, very singular limit allowing the domain to become infinite and all kinds of interesting effects happen. Like these, uh, like these eigenvalues that run off to infinity. That's a consequence of that. I will comment on the end of it. <laughs> yes. So actually, this is uh, the last example I have here. So I tried to uh, rush through it a bit. Uh, and here are the references. So thank you for the attention. And I'm ready for your other comments and questions. <laughs> 
Yeah, concerning uh, this. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Very thank you very much, Iveta. Uh, there are a few comments I would like to add. Uh, the first one is concerning uh, the previous uh, slide that you showed. Yes, there you have. Uh, you can see it very uh, in, in a very simple way from WKB. When you 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 just should draw your Stokes graphs. And you will see on these points, probably you have here endpoints, uh, they are just these uh, exceptional points on the Stokes graph or, or this uh, turning points where you are starting from. <clears throat> and uh, the point is that you should uh, connect those, the, the nearest uh, turning points to the endpoints of your line. This will, gives you, uh, will give you the uh, correct approximation. Otherwise you will, go far away and, and you will have no control. You will have blowing up solutions, horribly blowing up solutions and, and, and you will be uh, have no control about them. And, and the next point is uh, actually, uh, I'm suspecting that all your very beautiful pictures, they are hidden even more beautiful pictures. And uh, did you try to find for all these, these operators, these scaling graphs? Most likely you will have for each operator, you will have a typical scaling graph independently whether the domain is in, on, on R or an interval on R or on a, on, on a uh, R2 or RD domain. You will, all, for all these operators, there will exist some kind of scaling graph where all your eigenvalues are moving on it. And on these graphs, they will be have like uh, eigenvalues like in field theory following a certain kind of renormalization group. And what you have here, these scaling behaviors of your Eigenvalues is just an uh, implicit picture of this uh, renormalization group behavior on the scaling graphs. Yeah, I, I saw the scaling graphs in your article. You have lots and lots of uh, nice pictures there. Yeah, I, I haven't tried to uh, compute them for this. No. Well, yeah, all of this, it's, it's a bit different methods. Um, yeah, sure, sure, these methods are complementary. But uh, you will also find that uh, close to these turning points, in the WKB, it's most likely that your approximation will horribly break down because your uh, calculations will become extremely unstable close to these turning points in WKB. It means far away from the endpoints of your interval where you, are use, where you shifted your approximation. And when you are reaching those points where from one endpoint and from the other endpoint, these two Hilbert bases are somehow trying to match, you are reaching a uh, the exceptional points in the spectral picture and the turning points in WKB picture, then you uh, all your asymptotics is breaking down horribly. You can simply see it from the uh, approximation on of the area function type close to the boundary. So you have a, these converging sectors of the or Stokes wedges in the area function when you're coming to the boundary. You need exact results of the area functions and the approximation will break down. This is the crucial point underlying all these things, but it's uh, work for future, of course. But Michael I, Perry I, some I kind don't of... really know like where my results should collapse because like it, it, it's very simple because when like you... the formulas I have it's yeah yeah no they will collapse the... they hold and are... even like have the rates how how they converge and everything so. I know yeah. they are there and they when, you, when you're starting at the endpoints of the interval, where you shifted your original operators to one endpoint to the other endpoint, for instance, and then you're doing the asymptotic calculation, everything is fine, as long as you are sufficiently close uh, to these endpoints. When you are going farther from these endpoints of the interval, you are reaching the region where you have these turning points in the Stokes graphs and the exceptional points in your picture, and there all this approximation is breaking down horribly. You may test it, you, you will find it yourself. Or we can discuss it afterwards privately. Okay. I, I can make it once more in more detail. Okay. <laughs> but very beautiful results, very beautiful. Thank you. Any more questions? I have a simple one. Are you tracking the PT symmetry somehow? And um, I, I remember, on your last slide in the motivation section, you had the area operator. 
which is PT symmetric, but the truncated one had a broken PT symmetry. Does, does that matter somehow? And how is that restored in, in, the, in the limiting process? Or what? No, it's the last one. If you go forwards now. Yeah. No, <laughs> no somewhere no, forward. The last dot on motivation, that's what I remember. Oh, okay. Yeah. That one, yeah. Yeah. You see, oh. SN is not PT symmetric, whereas the area operator is. Okay, so all these results, they are not tied to PT symmetry. I know, like but I, I could, well, could ask the question, what happens to it? I understand you can do it for any kind of operator. I understand. But, but if you have it, um, what happens to it? That's my question. Um, would be curious. I, I think it's something we were discussing before that for the truncated operators, you see these complex conjugate pairs, but in the limit, it's not there. Yeah. So that that so it depends. So how is it restored then? Um, if you if you break it, you you sort of assemble assemble it together that it's restored oh, somehow. Oh, oh, oh. The area operator, all its spectrum is uh, on the full line. It's all at, at infinity. It's a result of this area uh, operator on a half line. Half line. Ah, uh, half line. Half line. Okay. Half okay. line. So it has purely discrete spectrum. It's, yeah, it's yeah. very different from the operator. Yeah, 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 the whole yeah. line. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The truncation can break PT symmetry, mm. yes. and I, 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 I think uh, if you have uh, a problem which is PT symmetric and you truncate it, uh, then you break a symmetry, and when you somehow remove the truncation, it returns somehow, and then the states have to disappear, which somehow are triggered. No, 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 the breaking. Not, no. That's what she said. Uh, Jörg has another question. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, whether whether your theory can be applied to other physical systems. For example, I'm thinking of a finite potential well. Of course, then in in, in quantum mechanics, you know uh, you have no uh, bound solution. You only have uh, resonances. And one method, of course, would be maybe a complex uh, scaling, complex uh, coordinate rotation method to compute the resonance state. Another method which I know is is this kind of truncation. You put your your uh, uh, your system in in a box and you change the size of the of the box and then you find some some stable in a certain way stable or converged converging eigenvalues and others. I think they don't go to infinity, but they become more and more dense when you enlarge your uh, system. Uh, what do you think? Is this uh, this idea some somehow related to what you are doing? It's exactly related. Yes. So there was this abstract theorem, and I showed you the application for the diverging eigenvalues, but that's not the only application. <laughs> you can also um, approximate any. Um, any operator and it doesn't have to, you know, diverge anywhere. <laughs> so, yeah, can I can I comment on on your just many other scenarios we didn't really um, researched yet. That it's quite broad and it can be applied on many different places. Can I just comment on on what you just said? Um, uh, you. An even simpler case is just to consider potentials that vanish at infinity. Instead of going to infinity at infinity, you can just take a potential that's, that is that has uh, has finite support and, and outside a finite domain, the potential is just zero. And you can uh, do calculations where you let the size of the domain go off to infinity. Okay, and again, you find this separation of eigenvalues, where you have a set of eigenvalues which is, which approaches one uh, one domain and another set that runs off uh, to infinity, uh, and and um, this is a, a generic effect, and it doesn't even require that you have eigenvalues of uh, eigenfunctions, sorry, that you have potentials that go off to infinity and infinity. They can even go to zero and infinity, and that gives you. Um, a further um, range of, of potentials to study. But Carl, one can put also points where wave functions are zero to infinity or uh, like the right. angular momentum, which somehow 
produces zeros at the origin or uh, if you have Coulomb uh, wave functions, uh, which are long range, but have singularities at the origin, which you can put to the infinity then uh, somehow inverting the situation. That's right. You can have you can have uh, potentials that vanish slowly at infinity. Iveta, you want to comment on this or? Um, no. Not really. <laughs> okay. okay. But, but thank you for the comments. Then Duncan has has another question. Duncan has a question in the in the chat. You want to ask it? I can. Yeah, read it. I, I was just yeah. I was looking for an, an intuitive understanding of why, if you truncate your domain symmetrically around the origin, say that you would um, you would break PT symmetry. I remember Robin boundary conditions respect PT symmetry. I think Iveta should answer this question. Iveta, you want to answer this question? Yes, so I actually don't know. I didn't really thought about it too much from this point of breaking and not breaking the PT symmetry. So maybe others will have some insight into that and uh, it's inside for me, something to think about a bit more. <laughs> If I might add a comment here, it's it's the following. It it might be more appropriate for this differential operators just to look at the different spectral branches that you are considering. When you are seeing the purely real eigenvalues, the eigenfunctions are PT symmetric. For the complex branches, they are corresponding to sectors of broken PT symmetry. You're seeing it because they're coming in pairs and they're com no complex conjugate eigenvalues. So the, the, this is elementary effect. So actually you have in this picture, you have a, a kind of uh, unified picture of parts which are exactly PT symmetric and other parts which are of broken PT symmetry. And you have different branches of the spectrum and they and where, where they're merging, of course you have your exceptional points there. And they are- I Ufa, that is a really good remark. That's that's really insightful. The, I think what your point is, is that when you're in the finite domain, you don't, it, it, the PT symmetry has to do not only with the, uh, the structure of the differential equation itself and the potential, but also with the boundary conditions. The boundary exactly. conditions have to be PT symmetric. But if you are not, if you do not, uh, have a, a range going all the way out to infinity, and you're in just imposing boundary conditions at, in, in a finite range, then what you're saying is that you don't know whether or not the eigenvalues correspond to PT symmetric domains, uh, uh, PT symmetric uh, um, uh, boundary conditions or non-PT symmetric boundary conditions. They're all mixed together. And what is happening is that as you let the size of the domain get bigger and bigger, what is happening is that the domain, the the um, the, the Stokes sectors are gradually emerging, and what you see is different eigenvalues corresponding to different Stokes sectors. Okay, yes, and they are they are gradually separating, and what you see is the PT set of uh, eigenvalues and the non. PT uh, exactly, exactly. and this picture is surviving also on, on, on the finite interval there you have these different uh, pieces of these scaling graphs and some of them are corresponding to broken PT symmetry others are to exact PT symmetry yeah, and very, very interesting. Picture, when you are removing this uh, truncation what you are seeing is just that uh, piece of the spectral uh, scaling graph which is lying in the finite uh, Piece of the spec of, of the spectral plane, and this is exactly PT symmetric. This is uh, what Carl found in, in the end of the 19s. So this is exactly this piece of the scaling graph. But there are other parts which are at infinity. They are not contradicting anything of your assumptions. And also the monotomy considerations, everything is fine. There's an additional structure which in the whole picture is emerging at infinity. It is something very similar to uh, Carter Penrose diagrams, uh, where you have a structure at infinity for cosmological horizons, for black hole horizons, or something like this. So, this is this analogy which is showing up also in the spect spectral pictures. It's, it's very well, nice, beautiful picture underlying it. 
well, uh, so, sorry for, uh, for uh, uh, hogging the discussion, uh, but uh, uh, in, my, in the random matrix uh, theory, uh, models that Roman and I uh, discussed, and uh, Roman spoke about it a few weeks ago, uh, you could see, the, well, the random matrix, uh, pseudo emission random matrix is some sort of a truncation uh, of an operator, and those exhibit always, uh, 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 when the metric is not positive definite, it al al always exhibit both complex spectrum and real spectrum together. Yeah, sure. It's, it's a typical operator self return in the grind space. They have these yeah. different behaviors unified in, 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 in one picture. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So maybe maybe the, there is a crane crane space interpretation. Of uh, course, of course, of course. course. Uh, what's been shown here? Yes, of course, mm -hmm. of course, it's underlying it. Mm -hmm. But Iveta is, and Peter they are looking at different aspects. It's a complementary view on all this oh. picture. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole picture, and only a few facets are up to now explored. The whole picture is still. Uh, yeah. To be uh, described completely, so it's it's, it's yeah. still work ahead. So it's it's not yet done. Very good. It's it's, okay. it's extremely interesting, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Congratulations to you both, Iveta and yeah. Pedro. Yeah. Thank you very much for the nice talk, Iveta. Yes, thank and you very much. Answering very nice. all the questions very patiently. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you very much. Okay. Any more comments? No. Privately. We see each other again in two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> bye yeah. bye.